All right, in this video, we're going to talk about four major properties of water that are a big part of why water is essential to life on Earth. But before I talk about these four properties, I actually want you to just take a minute to pause this video and jot down some notes on what you already know about water and make some guesses as to what the properties are that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so why am I asking you to do this? Um, one reason is that if you're right, then you know you probably don't need to spend quite so much time with this topic. Um, but if you're wrong, this is a fantastic time to be wrong. The funny thing is, if we're wrong about something, we often remember that thing way better than if we're right. Um, being surprised helps us to remember. So I hope you have taken the time to jot down what you know and what the properties, key properties of water are. And in any case, before I actually talk about these properties, let's talk for a second about water in general. First off, water is everywhere. So as I'm noting here, around 75% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And along with that, evidence suggests that life originated in a water-based environment. We're going to talk more about that uh, towards the end of the semester. Third, all living organisms are mostly composed of water, both inside of cells and surrounding cells. And so for example, um, here's a diagram that shows the overall body composition for your average woman and man. Um, notice that for both men and women, over half of what we're made of is water. And the diagram also shows you a little bit more about where some of that fluid's located. So about Two-thirds of it is found inside of cells, so that's this intracellular fluid compartment here. And then another one-third of it is actually in the space that's in between cells, this extracellular fluid, um, or what's uh, termed interstitial fluid and then blood plasma. So it's found both inside of cells and outside of cells. Okay, so, um, so we're all mostly water uh, inside and out. So um, lastly, some of the chemical properties of water that I started to mention in the previous video also matter. Uh, because water is a polar molecule, it has the potential to interact with many other types of polar molecules. And in a number of cases, water itself is one of the molecules that's present uh, in reactions. OK, so now let's come back to these chemical properties. So in liquid water, we have two types of bonds that are at work. Right? There are the polar covalent bonds that are found within a water molecule, right here and here. And then there are, um, and, and those lead to partial charges, right? So a partial positive charge near the hydrogen atom, partial negative charge near the oxygen atom. And then uh, this sets up water to start forming hydrogen bonds in between molecules. So right here, the positive uh, end of one water, water molecule is attracted to the negative end of another water molecule. However, in liquid form, these hydrogen bonds are fairly weak, so they're constantly breaking and reforming as water molecules move around. So that gives water, as I note here, low viscosity when water is in liquid form. And think about that as being in contrast to other liquids, such as something like honey or tree sap, which are very high viscosity liquids. In a high viscosity liquid, it's going to be really hard for things to move around in the liquid and interact. But in a low viscosity liquid, there's a lot of potential for stuff to move around and bump into other things. Okay, so now uh, enough of the suspense. What are the four properties of water that help to facilitate life? Well, um, the uh, hydrogen bonds that form and break between water molecules collectively make water what's called a cohesive substance. In other words, a substance that tends to stick to itself. And now one of the most fun demonstrations of cohesion comes from a video of an astronaut wringing out a washcloth in space. I'm going to post a link to that video below in this uh, section. In any case, uh, so why is that property of water so important? Well, it's important because of its consequences for plants in particular, uh, such as the tree that's shown here. So essentially, um, the way that water sticks to itself, let's look at that top animation again. The way that water sticks to itself into other surfaces means that if it's inside of a narrow tube, water can defy gravity and travel upwards. So this property of cohesion is, is what has made it possible for plants to grow tall. And what you see down here is um, a cross-section of 
of a plant where you can actually see water traveling up through some of those uh, narrow tubes in the plant in the xyla. Okay, so that's, um, that's the first property of water. So now the second property of water that facilitates life is that water has a very high specific heat. And just as a reminder of um, what specific heat is, uh, specific heat is the amount of energy that it takes to change the temperature of a substance by one degree Celsius. And to help uh, make that a little more concrete, um, here's a table that shows what I mean by that. Um, so this shows how much energy it takes to warm up a gram of liquid water. And so here in this table, for liquid water, it takes four joules to warm up one gram of liquid water. And then meanwhile, if we look further down on this table at things like basalt and granite and iron, uh, you notice that um, it takes less than a quarter of the amount of energy to heat up these other substances on um, the same amount. So now, why does this matter so much? Um, I think you should think for a minute about what would happen if most of planet Earth was covered in basalt instead of water. So if that were to happen, uh, and the sun hit the basalt during the day, the sun's gonna transfer in heat to the basalt, and then the temperature of that basalt is going to skyrocket, right? Because it's a low specific heat. And then at night, when the sun is not shining, the basalt's going to radiate all of that heat back out. And so the net consequence is that there would be very dramatic fluctuations in temperature every single day. Now, biological things are fairly fragile and can typically only survive within a fairly narrow range of temperatures. So this property of water, of, um, of having high specific heat, is very beneficial for supporting life because it means that uh, life can operate within a narrower temperature range. And as a side note, it's this property of water that's part of why climate scientists tend to track ocean temperatures very closely because it really means something different for uh, the, the world's oceans to change by one degree Celsius, right? So with this high specific heat, you know, as compared to uh, if air or land temperatures change because they have much lower specific heat uh, to change by that amount. So it means that um, if we're just tracking what's happening with ocean temperatures, that the oceans um, around the world, uh, if you see a change, a given change in temperature there, that means that those oceans have absorbed a huge amount of additional energy. Okay, so that's our first two properties. The third beneficial property of water comes from what happens when water goes from a liquid to a solid form. So when this occurs, the hydrogen bonds that form and break between water molecules, they go from a very disordered, more closely packed arrangement to a less dense ordered arrangement. Okay, so now I think the most fun way to appreciate this benefit is to imagine what would happen to a pond during the winter if frozen water was more dense than liquid water. So in the winter, what would happen is the air temperature is going to cool down. And eventually it's going to reach the freezing point for water. And that's going to cause water at the surface to freeze. Okay, so now if this frozen water is more dense, then it's going to sink, right? Down to the bottom here, okay? And so then what that means is that more of the water at the surface would be exposed and would freeze and um, would also sink. And pretty soon what you'd wind up having is a pond that is completely full of ice, right? And, you know, when all of that's happening, um, let's just say, you know, good luck to any animals that were trying to live in that pond. And um, as a side note, there's actually some exceptions to those animals, um, but that's a topic for animal physiology. Okay, so in any case, the fact that frozen solid water is less dense than liquid water and it floats means that water can serve as a temperature buffer in more way than one. Not only is it a buffer because of its high specific heat, um, but it also insulates water at the bottom uh, of ponds and oceans from freezing. Okay, so the last property of water that's beneficial to living things 
um, is the fact that it's polar means that it can interact with other polar molecules and it therefore can serve as a solvent. To give you a really simple example of this, um, here's a molecule of sodium chloride uh, held together as a solid by ionic bonds at room temperature in the air. But if you drop this sodium chloride in water, the partial charges from this water molecule are strong enough to cause the sodium and chloride atoms to dissociate from each other, and then they wind up being surrounded by what's called a hydration sphere that prevents the sodium and chloride ions from binding together again with each other. And notice that the orientation of these hydration spheres differs depending on the charge of the atom that's at the center. Um, and this actually brings us back to the opening picture that I showed you, which is a depiction of what happens to different types of substances. So these are substances that are nonpolar substances when they're in water. So in those cases, water is actually repelled from around the outside um, of the nonpolar substance. Um, but water is going to continue to form a cohesive network um, around the outside of that nonpolar uh, substance. And because of that, what can often happen is that multi multiple of these nonpolar molecules eventually wind up bumping into each other and assembling into a larger blob of nonpolar substance. So that's what's termed here um, as a hydrophobic assembly. So hydrophobic is water fearing. So nonpolar substances that don't interact with water are hydrophobic. Um, and so they can assemble um, into one of these larger assemblies. Uh, and as another side note, this is what happens when um, your uh, salad dressing um, or your mayonnaise um, starts to separate, right? Is uh, if you've got a bunch of uh, fat-based hydrophobic assemblies um, that are starting to form inside of that substance. Okay, so this brings us almost to the end of this tour of water's functions and how it facilitates life. Um, so here's our list of all four characteristics. So there's just one other aspect of water that we need to talk about here, and that is a tendency for water molecules themselves to get pulled apart by other water molecules. Uh, so sometimes the forces that are generated by these partial charges between neighboring water molecules can be sufficiently strong that they can cause one water molecule to lose a hydrogen atom, resulting in the production of a negatively charged hydroxide ion shown here. And we also typically indicate that the hydrogen atom comes to be associated with the other water molecule shown here as a hydronion ion. So this then sets up the possibility that an aqueous solution might wind up with an imbalanced ratio of hydroxide and hydronium ions. The biggest place where this happens in living organisms tends to be with what happens when carbon dioxide gets dissolved in water. So the set of reactions that I'm showing you here is fairly complex, and I don't want you to get too overwhelmed by the details. But the main thing that I want you to take away from this is just the fact that in cases where carbon dioxide reacts with water, the end result can be the addition of additional hydrogen atoms to that water. And so when the concentration of these hydrogen atoms increases, the overall consequence is going to be that the solution can wind up having a net positive charge. So now, since most of the molecules that are inside of a cell depend on a very specific balance of the charges that are in water, any change to this charge balance can have huge impacts on functions inside of the cell. We're going to dive into this topic in greater detail as we continue, continue to explore cell function. But for right now, the main thing that I want to comment is that we typically keep track of this balance of hydronium and hydroxide ions in a solution by using a logarithmic scale. And that logarithmic scale is the classic pH scale. So most biological fluids actually fall within a very narrow range of this scale, so somewhere in here between 6 and 8. And so that's a fairly balanced pH. However, we do interact with substances that have much more extreme pHs. So, you know, coke, for example, here, um, or soaps, or uh, lye, or bleach up here. And in fact, our stomach's pH is very strongly acidic. So it's down here, uh, around 2 or 1. And that's actually part of why our stomach is so effective at breaking down food.
Okay, so given all these properties, um, what I'd like to know now is, so how many of these four properties of water did you guess about correctly? Um, did anything here wind up surprising you? So let me know in the discussion section for this lecture. And from here, we're going to carry on with our next topic um, in biochemistry, which is all about why carbon forms the backbone of more complex biological molecules.